Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm the chair of the History of Nursing Forum of Royal College of Nursing, a group of, quite a big group of nurses who promote the history of nursing. Today we're looking at the history of mental health nursing, and I'm pleased to, in, to introduce Peter Nolan. I've known Peter for a number of years, and he's one of the founders, really, of, of developing the history of nursing, and has, has had a great, and still has a great, uh, presence in the history of nursing and the history of mental health nursing and um, he's going to share today Jack's story with us so I'm glad to introduce Peter. Uh, thank you very much Stuart. Uh, good evening everybody. I started psychiatric nursing in the early 1960s and most of what I learned about mental health and mental illness was acquired by listening to stories. Patients, doctors, tutors, and above all nurses told stories, their stories. Nearly a third of all the male nursing staff in hospitals at the time had spent some time in the forces. Some had seen active service in the Second World War, the Korean War still is, while others had done national service. I became fascinated with the lives of mental health nurses, who they were, their reasons for becoming nurses, and what they believed they were doing. One small group that intrigued me most were those who had spent time as POWs, prisoners of war, during the Second World War and who after their discharge decided to become psychiatric nurses. What I am about to present to you this evening is an account of the first POW I interviewed. His name was Jack. He lived in Trowbridge in Wiltshire and the interview took place one afternoon in May, 1986, 34 years ago. The anger, resentment, regret, loss and hatred that festered in his heart for years erupted at that interview. I dedicate this presentation to the memory of Jack and to all nurses everywhere who struggle with mental health problems. That meeting is as vivid in my mind today as it was on that afternoon. I first made contact with Jack by telephone and asked him if he'd be happy to talk to me about his experiences during the war and about his life afterwards as a, a mental nurse. He immediately agreed and said that he would be over the moon to talk about old times. When I arrived at his home, he extended a warm welcome, a very firm handshake and offered me tea and biscuits, mentioning that he considered it a great honour that somebody should be interested in him. Laid out on the coffee table were memorabilia of his life as a soldier and as a nurse. This consisted of photographs, letters, medals, and his certificate of mental nursing. He remarked that he saw few friends now from his nursing days and spent long periods by himself, just thinking. He admits that he frequently feels lonely and there are nights when I can't sleep. But of course, it's the images of the past and the depressions that keep me awake. Though he thinks a lot about the past, he rarely speaks about it. Jack was born in 1918 in a small town in the West Country. He had a happy childhood and developed a love of nature and the countryside. His best friend was Alfie and they spent many happy hours together, walking in the hills and the woods and by the river, fishing, and when the humour took them, getting up to boyish pranks. He left school at 14 and went to work at the factory where his father worked. 
Thinking about the beginning of his working life, he reflected. I suppose you would say I was working class, but comfortable. My father and mother saw to that. I had little education and didn't see the need for it. Getting a job and a wage were the big thing for a young lad at that time. It was a sign you were a man. A wedge gave you a great sense of pride and independence. The boss liked me. I was big and strong, and I could work all the hours that God sent. He worked at the factory for seven years, very happily there. During that time, he had two pay increases. And in a small way, I was thought to be a star at cricket and football. Being a popular sportsman in a small factory gave Jack a certain notoriety and job security. But the outbreak of war brought an abrupt end to all of this, and within weeks he was called up. His life from then on was to be drastically changed. After basic military training, Jack was considered ready to fight for his country. Being in the company of soldiers brought out aspects of his personality which he had not previously recognized. He was inspired about defending his country and eagerly looked forward to the time when he could display his courage, his strength and his masculinity. But deep down there was also a fear of the war and a dread that he might not come back alive. Having his old friend Alfie with him, of course, was a great security and a great comfort. And if things got really bad, they could sit together and talk about home and the old times. But Jack's war was short lived. He took part in the 1940 campaign in France and after a matter of weeks was taken prisoner. He was to spend the rest of the war from May 1940 to May 1945 in POW camps in Poland and Germany. Jack, Jack described his experience as follows. Well, really, I didn't see a great deal of the war except for the POW life. In fact, all I now know about the war is what I found out since I came back through reading books and talking to people. I knew absolutely nothing about how the war was going while I was in the camp. We got very little information and there was always the suspicion that what we were told were lies. There were some pretty bad times and then occasionally it was not too bad. It depended on which stalag you were attached to and the type of work that you were asked to do. You were put out on various jobs in the area, on farms, in sugar beet factories, road making, mining, and any other hard manual work that had to be done. <coughs> the worst thing I remember was the semi-starvation. The hard work, basic rations, and what was available was poor quality. The usual food was sugar beet leaves and carrot tops. We scavenged and all we could get was what often the animals refused to eat. Most of the time I felt sick. A good many died and there were frequent outbreaks of disease. There were long route marches when I nearly died. We were shouted at and had butts of rifles poked into our backs and ribs. Prisoners who collapsed from exhaustion got little sympathy from the guards. I thought long and hard about the pointlessness of war and the hopeless situation in which I was. There was not a waking moment when I was not aware of being watched by the enemy. My lowest time came when I saw Alfie shot by the SS. 
I was only 20 yards away, and I cannot remember why they shot him. I can't remember what I felt at the time. You see, my own survival was uppermost in my mind. Death was commonplace. It was the norm. You saw dead people in the ditches, in the gutters, hanging from lampposts. There was nothing unusual about it. Jack sat motionless for a while in deep thought. Slowly, he sat forward, put his head in his hands and began to cry uncontrollably. He shouted, he screamed, he convulsed, and all that pain was coming from deep within his soul. He just kept repeating, I'll never forget poor Alfie. These were powerful and painful memories of the past with which he was unable to cope. The pitiful sight of the amiable man who 20 minutes before had welcomed me to his house and invited me to have coffee with him was distressing to me. I sat there reflecting on his account of his life in the POW camp, realizing how traumatic it must have been to recount, and particularly for the first time. We sat quietly together for what seemed like an age. He then began to talk freely about Alfie's death and gradually regained his composure. He told me he had not talked about his war to anyone as honestly as he had revealed to me. I haven't even spoken to my wife about it. It's all been bottled up within me. I spent some time exploring why at the time it had, he had become so upset. Jack was eager to talk about the reasons for the strong emotions he had experienced. I like history, he said, but not my history. I thought I had it all sorted out, but I haven't. Perhaps this is what Christopher Lash meant when he said, there is a history that remembers and a history that arises from the need to forget. Then as if to assert himself, Jack set up sat up and said, you must remember that what you see in front of you was not always me. A lot of people talk about the retired as if they should be put out to grass. They are redundant. I feel at times as if the world has forgotten me. But there was a time when I was prepared to fight for this country and indeed, I spent five years suffering for my country and all for what? Yes, I suppose I feel bitter. When the war was over and Jack returned to England, he felt unsettled. He went back to his own job, but couldn't settle. And after attempting several other jobs, he decided that he would seek to contact a friend of his who was working as a mental nurse. Thinking back on it now, I know I was mentally disturbed at the time. I found it difficult to adjust to life away from the prison camp. I was all mixed up, very, very mixed up. Before I joined the army, I was high on optimistic and patriotic propaganda. But after the war, I went into a very severe dejection. Towards the end of 1945, he contacted his friend who had become a mental nurse and decided he would join him. It was a type of work Jack knew nothing about. And even after being given a job there, he was offered no explanation as to why he had been selected nor what he was expected to do. His first encounter with patients made him feel uncomfortable. 
these unhappy, discharged individuals were not what we had expected, and he seriously considered leaving. But for a number of reasons, he did not leave. And these reasons gave an interesting insight into his state of mind. The aspect of mental hospital life, which attracted him most of the time, was sporting activities. Football and cricket were the preferred sports. And within a short space of time, Jack was representing the hospital at both sports. Once again, his prowess was recognized. The superintendent of the hospital had a special regard for sportsmen. They had time off to practice, as well as having virtually every Saturday off. Jack was in no doubt why sportsmen were given such privileges. Sportsmen, he felt, were fit and healthy and good workers. They appreciated the facilities provided in the hospital which were far superior to facilities, even at professional football clubs. When he played away, of course, the superintendent always traveled with us and we were always aware that we were representing the hospital. Being regarded as a good team member, which we were, gave an enormous sense of pride to the superintendent. When we played at the hospital, either at cricket or football, hundreds of patients male and female, would turn out to cheer us on. Having good sportsmen to watch provided a certain amount of enjoyment for the patients. During my early years in nursing, sport became my life. The actual job itself was second. Jack played some sport every day, and an added perk was that he could choose whichever ward he wanted to work on. Mental nursing for Jack had much in common with service life. It was regulated and provided a sheltered existence with most of my needs taken care of. One had to do little thinking for oneself and there was plenty of company always available, particularly ex-servicemen. In fact, Jack admitted, there were times when I thought I was still in the army. I must admit, there were times when it was all that I'd hoped army life would be. I felt very proud of my uniform and it meant a great deal to me when the superintendent used to remark how smart I looked. Jack had not thought about undertaking training, but when he realized that he should, he entered into it with all he was worth. He thoroughly enjoyed attending lectures by doctors and found explanations for illnesses fascinating. He was, in his own admission, not very bright, but he recognized this as an opportunity to make something of myself. So life was a mixture of sport and learning. And for the first time since the war, Jack was beginning to feel settled but it was not plain sailing from then on. The purpose of training, as far as he was concerned, was to get a pay increase. He got a qualification, and once he got his qualification, he was somewhat disappointed. Get your exam and just forget about it, was what the others told him. My years as a staff nurse were very dull years. We spent long hours washing and dusting, polishing the floors and bed making. We were domestics really. On the refractory wards, we did little actual nursing. We went about with a bunch of keys opening and locking doors. We were warders really. One of Jack's lasting memories from his early days in a mental hospital was the amount of violence he witnessed. Some nurses were of the opinion that all the patients were in a conspiracy to make life as difficult as possible for the staff. Indeed, many nurses viewed the patients as the enemy. Jack was drawn into this way of thinking. He freely admitted that there was gratuitous violence against patients and that he too was aggressive towards them. There were patients 
who had developed mental illness during the war and had been brought back home. I often regarded them at the time as weak and wondered what they would have been like if they had had to endure what I went through. In moments of frustration, I would often lash out at inoffensive patients. I justified what I was doing on the grounds that I was keeping order and letting the patients know who was in charge. But there were other reasons for my behavior, which I did not recognize at the time. Jack admitted that trying to recapture his thoughts after so many years, but felt that a lot of aggression and frustration that was in me at the time arose from the need to get my own back. Having taken, having taken so much abuse in the POW camp, he felt he was getting even. Part of the outlet for these pent up emotions was sport and part of the assaults on patients, he agreed, was also retribution. He was surprised at the number of nursing staff at the time who were aggressive and could easily be provoked. During his revelation about his assaults on patients, Jack again began to get emotional and began to cry. He felt ashamed at what he had done and felt guilty about it. I'm still guilty, he said, and I will be guilty until my dying day. Nearly 20 years after he started nursing, Jack held the post of charge nurse. He began to think seriously about his past and attempted to um, take stock of his life. He became aware that he had used nursing for all his own ends and he entered what he referred to as his atonement phase. The energy that he once exerted on sport was now channeled into the care of patients. He took a keen interest in all the patients on his ward and organized parties and outings for them. He wanted to be involved in teaching student nurses the proper way to care for psychiatric patients. Some whom I've interviewed and who knew Jack during this time saw a change in this man. One nurse said, he changed overnight from being a hard man to being a kind and compassionate nurse. Jack was one of the first nurses at his hospital to become involved in community care. And he was very proud of the first patients to leave and to be rehabilitated in a small flat in the community. And he described one of these patients. The first patient he said I helped to leave the hospital was an old soldier by the name of Lionel. He had spent many years in a Japanese POW camp and he must have gone through hell. When I knew he was settled and happy in his little flat, I felt a profound sense of satisfaction. I suppose that pleased me most of all. And the fact that he was an ex POW like myself made it feel even better. Shortly after his retirement, Jack went back to work on the ward he had first worked on. There he spent two and a half days a week, just helping out. In his own words, he said, I felt I had to do it. Perhaps I didn't want to retire. And then again, perhaps I felt I felt I had to settle my account. He is now in his 70th year of retirement, uh, it is, sorry, in his seventh year of retirement, and he works as often as he can at the mental health center. Asked how he likes it there, he replied, I love it there. After years of experience, I have so much to offer mentally sick people. The young student nurses ask me about the old times and I tell them that though there were good times, 
I hope they never see the bad times come back. I think the nurses coming into nursing today are different from what they were in my day. They are bright, intelligent, they know their own minds, and they genuinely like being with and helping patients. It is ironic that Jack left full-time nursing as unprepared for retirement as he had been for nursing when he started. Even though he keeps busy, there are moments of solitude when he muses about the past. I often think when I sit here quietly at night that things could have been very different for me. I might have died in the war, the cause of which I still don't fully understand. I might have returned mentally ill and spent the rest of my life, not as a nurse, but as a, uh, but as a patient on the wards on which I worked. Talking about his experiences caused him great distress. He had not talked before in such an open and frank way, and he was relieved to be able to tell his story and grateful to me for listening. You've helped me, he said, to see things better and to get things off my chest. My final question to him before I left was, looking back over your life, how would you sum it up? If I had my life all over again, I would certainly do mental nursing. There will always be human misery. I regret that it took me nearly 20 years before I could get round to helping people. Even now, I feel I am a psychiatric nurse and I will carry on doing work at the mental health center as long as I am able to. Thank you very much for listening.